All right, take your Bible and turn to 2 Timothy 3. So that means that this morning we're able to take a little time. We don't have to be in a big rush or a big hurry uh, to get anything done. I, I, um, we're, we're in good shape, and then you'll be able to have a nice leisurely lunch and then get home and throw the lawn furniture in the pond or the pool or whatever you feel is necessary to do. You know, take the potted plants in that you like, and the other ones you kind of just forget, oops, you know, and they fly through the neighbor's window or whatever, but, you know, at least it's not your problem anymore, but uh, do whatever you need to do and then kick your feet up, hopefully enjoy your weekend and then be prepared to be back here on, uh, on Wednesday. Uh, let me say this, in spite of everything, you folks have been just absolutely phenomenal during the whole deal since March. Uh, because I get the privilege of talking to a number of people, this is not the norm. Uh, a lot of other places, it is not going quite so well. And there's pushing and shoving and disgruntled people and upset and all kind of other things. And your hunger for the Word of God, your hunger to be together, your hunger to continue to meet together is exemplary. And uh, you never really know what somebody is worth until they're under pressure. Pressure doesn't make you, it reveals what you are. Well, under pressure, you're like special forces troops. You just keep doing what you've been doing. You've just been steady. You've been consistent. You haven't been panicky. You haven't been trying to use this as an opportunity to push your agendas. I mean, it's just been amazing. You've been kind to each other. Uh, I'm going to feel real bad about preaching what I have to preach to you this morning. <laughs> But, uh, but it's, it's necessary and it's needful. <laughs> but but I, I'm giving you a, 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 a pre-qualifier, you know, that I, I, I want you to know that it's necessary. But I sure do love you. I'm proud of you. I'm, uh, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of the example that you've set. Uh, I was proud some of the ladies came yesterday and this first time they've been able to come back and stuff. And your kindness toward them, I watched and how you were gentle with them and sat with them and talked with them. It's just absolutely uh, amazing. So I'm not shining you on, maybe setting you up a little, but I'm not <laughs> shining you on. All right, now notice, if you will, please, in 2 Timothy 3, I want to come back to this one more time, and it will tie in with where we're headed this morning. Father, bless your word this morning. Thank you for it, and thank you for all your many blessings. We would appreciate it, Lord, if you continue to blow just a little harder from west to east and blow the thing off of us. Protect those people that may be around it that are having difficulties and problems and troubles with it, Lord, and watch over us, and we know where our help comes from. We know who it is that takes care of everything, and we'd ask, Lord, and we'll put ourself and our faith in you. We we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, I mentioned this on Wednesday night, and I realize it's, uh, it, it seems or it appears to be a little bit harsh. It's meant to be not harsh. It's meant to be a warning. It's meant to help you to understand that in the last days, if you'll pay attention to your own personal walk with Jesus Christ, if you start developing these symptoms, it shows that there's a problem. It's not put in the Bible to hurt you. None of God's commands are hurtful in nature. None of God's commands are done for any reason to try to, to, to be bad for you to do. Every thou shalt not is for a good reason. Amen. A lot of people say, well, why would God say this and why would God say that? Every time he tells you not to do something, it's for a good reason. Now you go all the way back to Genesis chapter number 3. And in Genesis chapter number 3, I like seeing that group of kids right there. That's a blessing. Glad to have all of y'all. In Genesis chapter number 3, the devil comes in and what does he do? He doesn't question the woman, he questions God. Yea, hath God said. He's looking at the tree. God said, don't look at the tree, don't touch the tree, don't eat the tree. You know how the thing's laid out there. Well, she's sitting there and he wouldn't ask her the question if she's not questioning it herself. So what we find out from the law of first mention is, is that if you keep looking at the wrong thing long enough, the devil will know exactly what question to put on you to make you think it's God's fault for making you be tempted beyond that. Listen, James 1 tells you no man that is tempted is tempted of God. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lusts. In other words, it's what I want to do. Now, in this passage, you're going to see uh, leading captive silly women. That's uh, women that are gullible. That's women that are led away by diverse lusts. That's women that are led away by these individuals who have a form of godliness, but they don't allow the Holy Spirit to control their life. 
Now, some of you are struggling, and you heard some of this yesterday, and the ability to change your mind, the way that you look at things, the way you consider things, the way that you perceive what people are saying to you. Some of you are trying but struggling with difficulties in your life, and the key is, is it shows you a lack of empowerment by the Holy Spirit to overcome the temptations, the things that are natural by human nature. Listen, it's natural when somebody walks up and smacks you to smack them. Right? I mean, you don't even think twice about it. They hit you, you hit them right back. But the Lord has a pause in there for you. He said, well, if he hits you on the right cheek, turn your left. They came up to Billy Sunday, that old preacher. He was a professional baseball player, and uh, he got converted and got saved and that kind of stuff. And he used to run the bases, and when he was preaching, he had to have a massage and a rub down when he got done because he'd get cramped so bad from sweating out there on the old sawdust trail and stuff. And the guy came up, and Billy Sunday was greeting people and talking to people as they came up there. And he walked up to Billy Sunday, and he knocked the tar out of him, knocked him down in the sawdust. And Billy Sunday got up and the guy said, now wait a minute, the Bible says turn the other cheek. And so Billy Sunday turned his other cheek and the guy knocked him down again. And Billy Sunday got up and mopped the floor with the guy. I mean, just stinking, just, I mean, beat him like a rented mule, man. And then got done with that and they said, preacher, preacher, uh, uh, I mean, uh, is that the right thing to do? He said, well, the Bible tells me to turn the other cheek. And he said, I did that, but it don't tell me what to do after that. <laughs> So I just took it upon myself to turn you out. Okay. Well, okay, if you did it that way, probably nobody would blame you if you let him hit you twice. But here's the illustration. The illustration is, is in the Christian life, without intervention from the Holy Spirit, you can't override human nature. It's natural when somebody says something about you that's hurtful to hurt them back. It's not natural to be forgiving. It's not natural. Here's a good one for you. Love your enemies. Be kind to those that despitefully use you. When reviled, revile not again. Let all anger, wrath, bitterness, and, emu and strife be put away from you with all em uh, emulation and clamor and evil speaking. Well, that's kind of hard to do in the flesh. Now, the, the thing that that happened, the thing that it should show you is, is that when your natural response is a human response, it lets you know you're not in Galatians 5. In Galatians 5, I walk in the Spirit, I don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. My flesh wants to be fulfilled. Never underestimate your flesh. The most powerful thing on the face of this earth is the body you're encased in. It controls everything you do. It controls revenge in you. It controls repentance in you. And the Holy Spirit comes to you, and I'll show you this this morning, and He puts you under conviction. A lot of people blame the preacher for it, or they blame the Bible for it, or they blame the church for it, or they blame you as a Christian for telling them what the Bible said. No, you can't blame them. The Holy Spirit's the only one that can put you under conviction. That's His job. If he's doing his job in your life, if he's active in your life, unless you're perfect or dead, then you know what happens when you do something wrong or you're fixing to, you know what the Holy Spirit says to you? Hey, 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 knock it off, knock it off, fixing to mess up, don't do it. Uh, my wife used an illustration yesterday. She tried to dismiss me, but I didn't leave. She said, you shouldn't be in here to hear this. And I'm thinking, okay, well, you just cooked your goose there. I'm not going to hear it. I'm recording it and taking notes. She said, there's times when we're having one of those discussions at home. She said it like that. What she meant was, is when we're having an argument, we actually have those on occasion. We really do. They get pretty, you know, um, demonstrative, shall we say, you know. I mean, we look like deaf mutes up there, you know, and that kind of a thing. And I, I don't mean anything by that. And, you know, and she said that the Holy Spirit says to her, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut, shut up. And I'm thinking, that's the problem. You don't listen to the Holy Spirit. That's it right there. That's it. That's, that's the deal. See, the Holy Spirit's trying to tell you what I've been telling you because I'm saying the same thing. Shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. And she's like, the Holy Spirit's telling me to shut up and now he's got to tell me the same thing. But, but listen to me, all joking aside, you can't overcome those things in your flesh. It is impossible to make yourself act in a non-human way or a non-human response without supernatural intervention. God gave that to you at the moment of salvation. He did that to help you, to strengthen you, to encourage you, but also as a barometer and a thermometer. A barometer is something that determines the amount of pressure. 
A friend of mine taught me years ago when I used to hunt quite a bit and, and what I learned was is when the barometric pressure drops, the animals begin to feed it, they feel it, they go out and they feed and then they go and they lay down. I've noticed that to be true. You know what happens when the Holy Spirit comes and that pressure gets on you? The natural tendency for the Christian instead of to go get good feeding is to go sleeping. The natural tendency when the pressure comes on you is to say, I don't want no more of that. But that's the Holy Spirit's job. That's a good indicator. He's active in your life. But you have to allow it. In 2 Timothy chapter number 2 where we are, he said they have a form of godliness, but notice they deny the power thereof. Now, that's generally taught this way. They have a form of godliness, but they don't realize the way that they can be godly is because the Holy Spirit empowered them to be godly. No, the empowerment there and the denying the empowerment thereof has to do with you denying the individuals that can look like everything they're supposed to on the outside, but they don't let the Holy Spirit active work on the inside. Deny him the right to rule and reign. Now, I'll show you this morning in the message, but the Holy Spirit is a male. He's a person. He's all God. And he's male. He, 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 he. No female stuff involved there. It's the Holy Spirit in the male gender. You can't make him something else and you can't do this monotheistic kind of thing they're trying to teach now and trying to teach, well, God is one individual and Jesus is one individual and Holy Spirit is one. No, it's one God, three manifestations. If you don't teach that, you're of the Antichrist. Jesus Christ is not a created being. He's God manifest in the flesh. Nor is the Holy Spirit. Listen, that you got to believe that. You say, why? If you don't, you're the devil. Right. The Mormon theology teaches that Jesus Christ and God, or Jesus Christ and uh, the devil, were brothers. They're no brothers at all. Right. In their Bible, you know, they do, they twist the thing and turn it around, and they make the Holy Spirit and they make Jesus Christ as if they're separate beings from God the Father. No, they're not. They're the same thing. Right. One God, three manifestations. Right. And he's the only one that can appear in all three places at one time. Amen. Now you want to get that. Now here's what comes down or here's what boils down for us as individuals, for us personally. Come to Isaiah chapter number 29. I gave you these the other night, but everybody uh, wasn't here. So let me just run over a few of this. So you can have the religious trappings and not have the power. Uh, years ago, I used a thing. Um, um, I, I used a reference to a, a beautiful car. I think I named that series, if I remember right, I think that thing was called uh, Engine Trouble. But the illustration that I made was, is that you have whatever car you like, I, Mercedes or Bentley or, or, you know, most of you guys around here, you all like trucks and stuff, or a Chevrolet or a Ford or, or you know, whatever, whatever you like, or I, I, don't, I don't even know what all's out there anymore. But, you know, you have the, the body style you want. Back in my day, the Corvette was the big deal. Not, certainly not the Volkswagen, but, but the Corvette. It wasn't uh, uh, driving an economy car in those days. They had hot rods back in, in my day. They had gas guzzlers, but gas was a quarter of a gallon. I mean, you know, you could, you, know, um, you could burn up a lot of gas and not really go, the bank broke. You could fill up your gas tank for $4. <clears throat> I mean, it didn't cost much. I can remember when they had gas wars and they dropped down to 12 or 13 cents a gallon. You can't imagine that now, but that actually happened. You say, when? Well, when Tyr Tyrannosaurus Rex and, you know, Cytrops and all them were walking on the earth back years ago. Pterodactyls were still flying in the sky and that kind of a deal. But here, here's the thing. Back in my days, you had hot rods and you have cars that look, you know, say, for instance, a Corvette. And it's got everything on it. Maybe it's metallic blue. Maybe it's candy apple red. Maybe it's midnight black. I don't know. Rolled and pleated sleets, uh, seats in it. and got plush carpet inside. A lot of guys will pull out the old carpet in there and put shag carpet in there and that shows you how long ago that was and and they'd carpet the trunk and they'd you know do all that kind of stuff and you look at that car and say man that is a beautiful car and you get in it and go to turn it over and nothing happens right. the lights don't even come and you go raise the uh, hood up and there ain't no engine the illustration is is that a lot of people can look good on the outside and dead as a doornail on the inside what we're talking about is being a spirit-filled Christian. Now, don't let that make you nervous. That doesn't mean Ostola, Shantai, Untai, Bowtie, Economy, Honda, and jumping around on the way. I've got to throw a sheet over you so you're not unmodest or something like that. Or, you know, do an Ernest Ainley, you know, be heat old uh, and knock you over on your back. Or, you know, get a Kenneth Copeland devil-possessed guy to tell you to buy him a new airplane or any of that other kind of stuff. That's not what being filled with the Spirit is. Being filled with the Spirit means I'm yielded to, I'm obedient to the Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit tells me to do things. Now let me just tell you about the Holy Spirit. He's holy. That means what He's going to tell you is nine times out of ten going to run contrary to your flesh. The Holy Spirit's going to drag that miserable carcass, that carcass down here and say, now kneel down and bow your head. Lord, I can't right now. He's talking about bitterness and envy and strife and unforgiveness. And, and if I go down there now, they'll think that I'm guilty of all those things. The Lord says, you're guilty of plenty. Get on down there. And the flesh says, I ain't going down there. You're not embarrassing me. I'm not going over there to do that. That's, that means I got the form of godliness. I'm sitting in church, but I don't need nothing. Everything's fine with me. Well, I'll show you maybe this morning that you can be lying to the Holy Ghost. You can restrict Him. You can restrain Him. You can hold Him back. That's God you're restraining. Don't make it a littler God than God the Father. That's God that after Jesus Christ left, the Comforter came, and He came to convince and convict the world of sin and so on and so forth and righteousness and judgment. He lives in you right now. That's God in you right now. And you know what He does? He gives you the ability to override the Creator of the universe. By His words, things were spoken into existence. He speaks a star cluster into existence and they now got out there and they think, oh man, the Milky Way, we think the Milky Way is everything and now they're saying, we think there must be at least a hundred galaxies our size or more. <laughs> you think? You say, why? God's where in the universe? God's clothed with the universe. And then He put limits on it for right now. That's a whole other deal. But here's what you need to understand. That whole thing is in God. Now that being is in you right now. And He comes to you and He says... Why are you talking like that? Why are you saying that? Why are you hearing that? Why are you going there? Why are you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? What about this? What about that? You see, here's the problem with Christians. They get real frustrated and they don't understand a principle because we're so worried about being charismatic, we don't teach about the fruits of the Spirit. So we're afraid to say anything about the Spirit because we're afraid somebody will say we're charismatic. But being yielded to the Spirit is a biblical truth. And when you get frustrated, it's because you're trying to act like a Christian without the power in you to do it. You've got to activate Him by saying, Lord, help me. Amen. I think a great prayer is, Lord, help me. Amen. Sometimes I pray, help me, Jesus. Yes. You say, no, yeah, I do. That's what I say, help me, Jesus. If I'm having one of those, you know, discussions, <coughs> she might see my mouth moving. I'll be saying, help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus, because something in me is wanting to maybe do something I shouldn't or say something. You fellas never had that problem. I can tell, look at y'all like, we don't ever have that problem. I'm going to put a microphone in your house one day, and I'm just going to play it. No video, just the microphone up here and go, now, did you want to, you know, because y'all are like, I just, I've, never, I've never even had that problem. Have I, babe? I mean, we're... <laughs> But here's the frustrating thing, and this is what happens, and this is why back years ago, biblically, or excuse me, uh, church history-wise, this is why so much was turned up on the pants and pork and the haircuts and hemlines, because they were trying to make people outside what they thought they should be that can only be accomplished from inside outside. But if we can get everybody to look the same, it looks like we've all already arrived. None of us have arrived, unless you've been to heaven and back. And if you have, I don't want to hear about it because you're not biblical. But at any rate, if, unless you've died and you're in heaven now, you're not fixed yet. You're broke. And so am I. I'm not saying I've obtained. I want you to understand. I've got just as many fleas on me as you do. You just can't see them as readily. I know better how to cover them up. But I scratch just as often as you do. Here's the thing you want to understand. That if you try to accomplish that, you know what will happen? You'll be done with church. You'll be done with prayer. You'll be done with Bible reading. You'll be done with uh, people in the church. You'll be so frustrated with people in the church. You say, why? Because we're all hemorrhoids. Right. Or armpits. Let me change that. I'll, I'll get better. I promise you. I'll get more sophisticated as the years go on. I, I don't mean to make such a harsh uh, illustration of what you look like to other people. I, let me not call it what it really is. The baby ugly. Let me... Let me say, you know, you, you look, you know, you look like a dirty fingernail. No, a dirty fingernails is not that. You burn an itch at the wrong time, the wrong place. You're never welcome when you're there and you can't wait for somebody to leave. You can't deal with other people without the power of the Holy Spirit in you. Amen. You can't do it. You say, why? We come from every walk of life and not only that, we're going through different things right now. Amen. I'm watching somebody going through some stuff right now and they are whacked out. 
And you say, well, what do you think about it? I think they're going through a rough patch. They're acting out of character. It's not normal for them to act that way. They're acting that way right now. Why? There's pressure on them from somewhere, but I want to help them, but you, you can't help them until they say, what's my problem? Uh, I'm going to tell you what your problem is. Well, you need to quit this and quit this and quit this and stop this and start this and start this. And I'll just say, you need to surrender. You just need to throw up and say, you know, Lord, I can't handle this. You're asking me to overcome something I can't do on my own. I need to empower, not deny the power. I need to empower the Holy Spirit. How do I do that, preacher? I get down and I pray and I turn my hands up like this, you know, and I, I you, know, you know, we worship thee, we worship thee, we worship thee, we worship thee, we worship thee. Put a sock in it, man. We're so tired. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns he reigns from heaven up. Our God. Is all. You dance around long enough, you're going to get dizzy and pass out. It has nothing to do with all that foolishness. That's a whole bunch of tomfoolery. That's a bunch of, as my friend used to say, it's a bunch of possum fat. That don't get you nowhere. You know, when you're struggling, you know what you got to say? Lord, I surrender. Me, me, me. I'm giving me up. Lord, you can have the car. Lord, you can have the wife. You can have the kids. You can have the house. You can have the Lord's like, I don't know none of that stuff. You don't mean nothing until you have you on the altar. Yes. The greatest Isaac we have in our life today is us. Amen. The Lord said, carry him to the altar. You're supposed to die daily. It's like, well, Lord, I mean, do you know what he means to me? You're like Isaac. Abraham's like, man, he can knock the gnat off a fence post at 300 yards. I was there with him when he caught his first bass, when he killed his first deer, and he started raising his own sheep and his own goats. And man, I'm going to tell you what, he is a man about town. The Lord's like, mm -hmm. I see how you're always defending him. You're always taking up for him. I tell you what's the problem. Now he's between me and you. And you take him up there to the Moriah, the land I'll tell thee of, and offer him there for a sacrifice, and then maybe me and you can get back in the fellowship we ought to have. That's what we're talking about right here. In the last days, it's not just this idea we can have church like the church in Ephesus without God in it. It's we can have a personal idea of Christianity and deny Him really the ability to say, I want you today. Uh, years ago when I was coming up, and this would be in the early 70s and the Vietnam was beginning to close out just before they start shoving the, the Hueys off the flat tops and things like that and they're all high, high talented after the Tet Offensive out to, uh, to Saigon and things like that and I was thinking about where I was going to go and what I was going to do and you get your draft card in the mail and, and things like that and so it's like, well you get your draft card, you go and whether you want to go or not unless you burn it and go to Canada <coughs> which if you did, I don't want to hear about it but at any rate, thinking about all those kind of things going on, and they had a poster that was up. They put up in the school where I was, and they had a poster that was there right by the counselor's office, and it's Uncle Sam dressed in his, you know, red, white, and blue with his big top hat on, and got a big picture of his finger that looks giant, like a big preacher's finger, and he says, I want you. And what they're wanting you is for military service and get you to come and to serve your country and, and so on and so forth. You know what the Lord wants even after you're saved? He wants you. That's why when you preach what the Bible says, even Christians are like, I don't like that. The Holy Spirit's like, well, I'm not done with you yet. The audacity of us to think that now that we're saved, that God's made us perfect. Listen, that has to do with your soul and eternity. But if you're honest and look in the mirror of God's Word, nobody in this building can say, well, you know. That's right. You might be able to say, well, I don't have his problem. And the Lord's like, yeah, you're right. You don't have his problem. You ain't got Esau's problem. Jake. You know what he makes Jacob do when he's wrestling with him out in the cornfield? You know what the world's trying to do? Starve you to death and offer him the potage. You say what? Some of you Christians, you know what you're doing right now? You're saying, I despise my birthright. I despise being a Christian. I despise, I can't do what I want to do when I want to do it. And you're just eating up the world's slop, red beans and pottage. Just eating it up. You say, what is that? Feeding the flesh. Feeding the flesh. Saved, going to heaven just like I am. See, preaching like this kind of stuff is the old school preaching and all. But I'm talking about inside out. Paul said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I'm saved. I'm born again. That don't mean I'm perfect. If I could help you Christians to understand when you look at other Christians, you're looking at non-perfect beings. Do you understand? The ones that you think you really like, you just don't know them. I have some friends who know me and they still like me. That's a real friend. 
because you got room to mess up. But if, if you, 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 can't under, you can't understand when I'm looking at you, I see the best part of you. And I'm thinking, oh man, what a blessing. And the Lord's like, I'm telling you what, man, they're getting ready to go do business with so-and-so. They're getting ready to have a throwdown, getting ready to run around on their husband, run around on their wife. They're getting ready to have a relationship over the internet. They're getting ready to do this. They're doing that and all that. And I'm like, Lord, I don't see that. And the Lord's like, yeah, you couldn't handle what I see. That's why the preaching of the Bible in a church that will skin your hide on a regular basis will constantly bring you up there in front of the throne and go, Lord, oh, you're right, it's, I got a problem. Amen. The best preaching is preaching you take personally. Amen. This idea, I go to church and I, I, I feel bad. When I walk into church, I'll feel worse than I did when I got there. Yeah. That's a good thing. Yeah. You say, why? That's the Holy Spirit that did that. No, that's that red-headed fool up there that gets mad and jumps around. And has, why's he got to holler? Why's he got to be this? And why's he got to... And the Lord's like, I don't know, man. I've been whispering for years. You ain't listened yet. Maybe I wouldn't have to be so loud if you'd listen to him when he talks in that still, small voice. As that little uh, woman said to me that time, you know, I just don't believe that the Holy Spirit has to yell to get his point across. Oh, you need spiritual hearing aids, ma'am. Work on your attitude a little bit. I guess the last preacher you had did whatever you told him to do, and that's why you're living the way you're living. I never heard hail so many times in a sermon in all of my life. I've been in church, I've been in church all my life. I never heard a preacher say hail so many times in a sermon. You trying to air condition it, sister? You planning on going there? You afraid I'm talking you feel bad because I'm talking about your house? I'm talking about your home, I'm talking about where you're going? I can't help whether any preachers said it again. But when she first said that, I've told you the illustration before. I said, well, thank you. And she, she got mad. She thought I was being sarcastic. I wasn't. The sermon was on hell. But she'd been going to churches where they never would mention it. So then she comes to church and's mentioned, and she took it that I was saying to her, you're going to hell. Well, I hate to tell you from her attitude, and I can't judge a person's heart, looking at the way she responded to a message on hell, I'm thinking she's going to go to hell from the church pew. Yeah. Listen, there was an old man sitting here for 92 years, 92 years before he got saved in church for better than 60 years before he got saved going to hell from a church pew. Going to hell, sitting in the church house and, you know, amen, worship, praise the Lord, hallelujah, glory to God. No spirit-filled life at all. You say, what is spiritual, spirit-filled life? Is it a deeper life? Well, it certainly is a deeper life. It means your life is hidden with Jesus Christ and Him. It has nothing to do with my wants, my desires. It means before I do anything, I ask Him first. You know what thanking God for your food is? I'm coming to this in just a second. Just, you've got to give me a, a minute here. You know what this thing, the, the uh, coming to the Lord and thanking God for your food is? It's pausing and realizing that you didn't put that food on the table. Amen. It's pausing and recognizing that without God, you can't survive. Amen. You say, it's just, you know, you're just being uh, uh, pharisaical. Miss Linda's thinking, maybe I don't want to join the church today. I was really... <laughs> but, but listen, you know what you're doing? You're thinking to yourself, God, without you, I can't survive. You can't live without eating. Just try it. Amen. You want to know what a dirty, rotten rascal you can be? Stop praying for about those say, three or four weeks. And stop reading your Bible for three or four weeks. And stop coming to church for about six or eight weeks. You will be surprised what you as a saved individual can do without the influence of the Holy Spirit in your life. You're capable of doing anything. If God doesn't do that, you bow your head and you pray. What are you saying? I'm thanking God. That's to make you pause and realize if God wanted to snuff you out, He could snuff you out right now. He could suck the air right out of your lungs. You'd be gone right now. Nothing you could do about it. You can't, you can't, you don't control your breathing. You couldn't do nothing about it. You put food on that table right there. That's a necessity. Food, water, and air. You got to have it. You know what you do when you say thank the Lord for that? I'm not talking about your girth side. I could care less about all that. How you hiked and all this. I'm talking about thanking God for what you put in your mouth is recognizing that if God didn't provide it, you die. Amen. The idea of thinking Allah, thinking Muhammad. My aching back. I know who gives me breath. I know who puts my meals on the table. I know who gets me from point A to point B. You say it's the pilot and the plank. Uh-uh. 
Mm -mm. I know exactly how I get there. The Lord says, you're going to go. I'm going to get there. He said, well, what happens if you have a shipwreck? I guess the Lord's going to, what happens if you get snake bit? What happens if you're freezing to death? I guess the Lord wants me to be get snake bit and freeze to death. But the bottom line is, ladies and gentlemen, is you have to recognize everything you have comes from God. You got clothes on your back? Yes, sir. Yep. So yeah, I work. I go down to the famous place to get a suit. I get a, some clothes for my wife. I go to the thrift store. I get wherever I get it. You know what you better do? You better not be thanking the silkworm for your clothes. Yeah. You better not be thanking the little lamb or the, or, the, or the cow that's shed to get your leather shoes and leather belt and all that stuff. You better thank God for the clothes on your back. Yeah. You say, why? He clothed you. You're the only being that's created with a sense of reason in the book of Genesis, and you don't come with a, a suit of clothes on. God has to provide for you a suit of clothes. You were once clothed with light, but when you sinned, that light fell off, and the Lord said, that's pretty ugly, man. I don't care what Facebook says about you. you ugly. You say, how you get ugly? Do you ever think about where you get your comparisons of beauty? What makes you think what you call beauty in Hollywood is beautiful to him? You've never seen true beauty. You don't know what true beauty is. Now you're thinking, see, you're, th you're thinking, well, no, you're comparing humans to humans. You think you've seen intellect before? Einstein? Tesla? Darwin? Young? Freud? You think you understand the human mind? You never understood that. You say, what? It's in the page of the book, God's mind on paper. Amen. You know what? Who wrote that book? You know who created the beings? It's in you right now. Yes. You know what he says? Let, allow that mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Yes. How am I going to know the mind of Christ if I don't read the book? Yes. Well, well, preacher, I mean, you know, that's why he says in everything give thanks. Is the concrete holding me up? Nope. My legs are holding me up? Nope. God's holding you up, or you'd sink right through the concrete. The bench holding you up, mm -mm. by the word of His power, everything's held together. When the Lord changes that, everything comes apart. You say, no, it's glue, and it's being molded, and it's cut out of the wood. And just say, no, 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 you, you got it. You're whacked out. You're a, you're, a, you're a fool. I could blow any scientist's mind in the world, and they get up there and give me all the relativity, and give me all the, you know, the square pie, and this and that and the other, and, and lay all that other kind of stuff, and I'd say, okay, you think you got it figured out? I'm telling you, the whole thing in the universe is held together by the power of His might, by His words. Amen. And when he speaks the word, it'll all come undone. Yes, Amen. Amen. First and second law of thermodynamics. What'll happen? It'll just explode. And then the Lord will take it and make a new heaven and a new earth. You say, surely you don't believe that. If it wasn't for God, you wouldn't be able to even understand the law of gravity that allows you to be able to stop when you're sitting on a pew. Because they're up, they oppose themselves. The law of gravity applies until you hit an object that's more solid than the gravity that it applies to. You think I'm kidding you? Come up here and stand on the pulpit and then jump off to the floor and tell me which gives. I guarantee you it won't be the floor. So, well, but the law of gravity. The law of gravity says you go until something more solid than you stops and then it stops you from falling. You can't do that. You say, who does that? God. God does all of that. Every bit of it. People are looking at the thing out there blowing around now. It's a hurricane. It's a storm. It's a tropical storm. It's not coming together. It's coming together. It's going to come together. It's going to come this. It's going to come that. I see people more worried about what's going on with that thing. You know more about the newscast and the track of the coming storm, hurricane, whatever it is right now, than you do about Genesis 3. Come on. Come on. Wow. Yeah. You've been glued to that thing. Just You probably you know on the break, you it's jogged 14 degrees to the left. It's in a north, northwesterly direction. What will we do? I don't know. Then about the time you make an adjustment, the Lord's like... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the next thing you know, it's like peeled out and it's headed to Bermuda. And you're like, yeah. well, I didn't see that coming. Oh, well, I wasn't worried about it anyway. You, yeah, that ain't true. You done put your pool furniture in the, in the, in the pool. Being yielded to the Holy Spirit is as simple as understanding He's in control. When you die, what goes? Your soul goes. Why? Your flesh isn't saved. 
Look, if you will, please, and remember Samson. Samson in the Old Testament, the Bible says he wist not that the spirit had departed from him. <laughs> In the Old Testament, you know what he says over there? It's not COVID. Don't worry. Just got a little runny nose this morning. I won't breathe on you. Um, when the Lord writes Ichabod, you know what happens? He said, the spirit hath departed. It's a picture. It's a picture. It's a picture. It's a type that you have no power to overcome your enemies if you don't have the spirit. And the book of Isaiah here, look if you will, please down in Isaiah 29, look in verse number 13. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, form of godliness, and with their lips do honor me, form of godliness, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of who? Amen. Men. So guess what happened? The commands of men get them more jacked up about elections and virus and conspiracies and all that then God, the Lord's like, what are you afraid of that for? I'm behind all of it. Who do you think put all that together? God certainly allowed it in His permissive will. Whatever evil is behind it. Can I ask you a question? When the Antichrist comes, by the way, after the rapture, Amen. you ain't going through the tribulation. Amen. We still believe that here. Amen. So, but, but let me say this. Does not the Lord allow him to come? Sure he does. Does he not allow him to come and to reign on this earth for the time period of the great tribulation? Does he not allow him to do those kinds? Of sure he does. He lets him have his time. And at the end of that, the battle of Armageddon, he whoops him, puts him down in hell and lets him stay down there in the pit for a thousand years and brings him up, lets him gather another army, has the battle of Gog and Magog and, and they come out there and they have another war that's put together. Those wars are separate. They're a thousand years apart. And the Lord, we get saddled up. We're all lathered up. We're going to go fight. And the Lord's like, I got this one. And he goes and he destroys him with the spirit of his mouth and boom, heaven and earth pass away. Great white throne judgment. And the devil comes in and he says, okay, let's set the record straight straight now. The only reason you ever had any power at all is because I allowed you to do all the things that you did, but you let it go to your head and you thought, you know, I will, I will, I will, I will. How's that working out for you? And he'll bow his head and bend his knee and confess Jesus Christ is God to the glory of God the Father. And the devil will say, depart from me and put him in the lake of fire forever. And until that time, anything that happens, God allows it. Can't God stop it? Sure he can. But he doesn't because he allows the free will of man to make a choice. The Holy Spirit will never override your free will. Now please understand this. I come to the close of Sunday school. I don't want to keep you too long because I need a little break before we start this morning. But please understand this. I don't care how hard you pray and you should. I don't care how often you pray and you should. God will not overpower someone else's free will decision just to make you happy. I don't care if they're a prodigal in the pig poke. I don't care if they are unsaved and on their way to hell. You can pray for them, but if they choose to reject it, God's not going to say, you know what, I hear your prayer. I'm going to make them get saved just so it'll make you happy. He doesn't do that. It breaks the principle of free will. That's where Calvin messed up. Calvin messed up by thinking you don't have a free will. No, free will started in Genesis 2 when the woman's looking at the tree. Why did he put the tree in the garden? To give them a choice. Amen. You still have a choice. But listen, pray for your kids and pray for the prodigals and pray for other people. But here's the thing. I'm praying for sister so-and-so to get right with me and I'm praying that God will make her do this and God will make her do that. And the Lord's like, if she don't want to do it, I'm not going to do it even if it makes you happy. So how about, let's work on you. You have control over you. You heard it yesterday. Amen. You can't control other people. Right. If you would understand this, it would take so much pressure off of you. You're not the Holy Spirit. Amen. You didn't believe me. Some of you are like, yeah, I don't know. I just think, mm -mm, mm -mm. you can pray. You can ask God for wisdom. You can ask God for humility. You can ask God for surrender. But when it comes to how Brother Waters is acting, you got no power over that. You can make him behave while you have him in certain uh, situations and circumstances, but you have no control or no power over his life. You pray for him, and if he doesn't yield to God, listen, you can pray till the cows come home for somebody to come to church. If, if they don't want to come, you can't pray them in the doors. At some point, that prayer gets through. God throws open the doors and said, what out? Will you take it? Come on. Come on. Will you come? Will you come? Come on. Will you come? 
I watch some of you sometimes at the invitation. Uh, during the invitation, I see the Lord dealing with some of you, and I see him fighting. And I, I've, I've learned, I understand, you don't judge preaching by the response to it, but I see some of you struggling. You know what it is? It's a matter of whether or not you yield to what God wants you to do. I can't control that. I would like it for you. I'd like it for people in my family. Sure. Really. But sometimes I think the Lord hesitates there because I think that he might look at me and say, the only reason you want that is so you can show you were right. So maybe you get that off the table and maybe I might deal a little bit more with them. But maybe the truth is, is that you only want them there so you can go, nah, 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 nah. I mean, I know y'all aren't like that. I'm probably a little too much of an open book. But sometimes, you know what I realize? I realize sometimes the problems with the people's lack of response is me. That's God's business. I told a young lady the other day, and we were having a, a discussion about a couple of things, and I said, Sister, no offense intended, you're in God's lane right now. What do you mean? I said, you are, you are trying to tell God how to do his business, Eve. I said, you're in God's lane. That's God's business. Pray about it. Leave it with God. It ain't your job to change it. Amen. That ought to give you liberty. You ought to be able to stand on the pew and shout, hey, praise the Lord to Jesus over that one. That'll help you out. Listen, your kids come to a certain age where you've done all you can do for those kids and you pray for them and ask God to help them and after that, they become accountable. These kids that usually sit in this pocket right over here, in this area right here, the majority of these kids over here, they're old enough to be accountable for their own decisions. That don't mean you're out from underneath your parents' authority, but you know, a well, you know well and good that your mom and dad tell you not to and you make the decision whether to believe them or don't believe them and do it or don't do it. You're old enough to make your own decision. You're old enough to get your tail tore or, or, or get time out or whatever they do if you do it. That's what happened to me when I was. I, wasn't, I never got too old to whoop. I mean, even when I got older, I was a pretty good sized fellow back a long time ago. And I went to my daddy and that kind of a thing. And, and he said, you think I can't whoop you, boy? By that time, I had so much respect for my daddy. If he'd have told me to bend over, I'd have took the whooping. You say, why? Because I respected him. Right. Because I knew what he was going to whoop me for. I deserved the whooping. Yeah. The thing you have to understand is it should give you great liberty in Christ is pray for it and get out of his lane. Amen. Stop trying to be God in everybody else's life. Stop trying to tell them what they need to do and how they need to do it. It would save you. It would help you so much if you would just quit worrying about having to gather a, a, a congregation of people to follow you and your foolishness. Do what God tells you to do and quit worrying about it. Amen. There's great liberty in that. And if God's telling you to do something and you think it's God and it's contrary to the Bible, you're a liar. You're doing the devil's work. You ain't going to fool me at all. I'm going to tell you what the Bible said. Well, God told me otherwise. He don't tell you something contrary to that book. Amen. Amen. Well, I didn't have time to finish up the thing, so we'll finish it up on, uh, on Wednesday night. Uh, Father, bless your word this morning, and I pray you'll be with us in the upcoming service. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.